In the name of Jesus, amen. The Lord worked a harsh message against Israel and Judah through the prophet Hosea, and Hosea had to go through some challenging experiences in order to bring that message to the people of Israel. Some listened, many didn't, and so the message keeps coming back. Right before we hear today's Old Testament reading, there's a stretch in Hosea where the Lord is bringing down judgment on the children of Abraham, on the children of, of Isaac, of Jacob, of a family, then a nation that he had formed, that had fractured, already bickering, even before they were a nation, then brawling, and finally, after Solomon, splitting the kingdom into two pieces because neither side could see right. And that continues on and on, year after year. A few good kings, a lot of bad kings, a little bit of righteousness and a whole lot of rebellion. And in the midst of all of that judgment, the Lord says, I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face and in their distress earnestly seek me. That sounds like God is willing to forgive when we realize that we have sins that need forgiving. In fact, we know that God is ready to forgive even when we're not ready to confess our sins, even when we're not ready to listen to him, even when we're not ready to take his forgiveness in exchange for our unrighteousness. Here, God says, I'm going to pull back. I'm going to get out of your way, and basically you can do whatever you want. You can talk and walk and act however you please. I really don't care. Now, sometimes parents say that to their children, have down through the ages. They keep arguing with their parents. They keep causing trouble in their family or their community, and finally the parents say, well, I'm not going to take care of you anymore. I don't have to support you. I'm not going to support you. You're on your own. As parents, we want our children to be out on their own and so that they don't have to depend on us for everything, that they can make up their own minds, that they can earn their own livings, that they can raise their own families, that they can help their community, their nation, their world in some way or another. But we still care and we're actively involved in one way or another in their lives, but here it's a parent who is at wit's end, except God's never at wit's end. His unimaginable, complete and total knowledge, his wisdom, he knows exactly what's going on, he knows exactly what's going to happen. What happens here after he's been laying out all this judgment, including this last little bit, is then he starts putting words into his people's mouths. This is what God wants to hear coming out of their ears. Come, let us return to the Lord. For he has torn us, that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up, that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on and know the Lord, for his going out is more as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. That's the Lord's hope. As I said, he puts these words in the mouths of his people here through the prophet, but unfortunately, when they hear these words, they don't start coming out of the word out of the mouths of God's people. There's not a wholesale rush to ask God's forgiveness, his pardon, his peace, his presence. They just go on sinning away. God wants those words to come out like he wants them to come from us. I am really sorry. And not just what I've done in thought, word, and deed that we confess so easily and so much at times by memory when we come before the Lord in his house, but he wants the heart and the mind to connect to those words. He's tired of the emptiness of what's going on in Israel, and that's part of what he condemns here as he gets back to his words of judgment. What am I going to do with you? I've heard that, and I've probably said that, and... That's what the Lord is saying to them. In some ways, it's like, well, you think of what I can do in order to make things go the way they should. 
what am I going to do with you? The love like a morning cloud. And in a dry climate, those clouds disappear as soon as the sun comes up and the humidity starts lowering. You love about that long and that well. The dew being taken up. So what's God do? He chops them down with the prophets, including Hosea right here. He bites into them with his words as he has done all the way since he pronounced the first judgments, as he would do through others of the prophets, as he does through John the Baptist, even at times Jesus and those who came after him, calling repentance by reminding people just how serious their sin was. And they still don't listen. I slay them by the words of my mouth. God pronounces judgment and it happens and still they persist in sin. What does he want from all of them? As he says, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. God doesn't want them coming to church, leaving their offering, whether their financial support of Israel, of the priests and the house of God, or their ongoing worship, their words of prayer and praise that are every bit as empty as their words of confession. He wants their hearts so that he can change them because whatever's coming out of their hearts is responsible for this mess they're in. And so when God draws away, God's people are rudderless. God's people are without protection, without blessing, without guidance and joy. If they're not going to listen to God when he calls them to repent, then he's saying, why should I listen to you when you call for help? So instead of calling to God for help, they'll go on and they'll start trying to make allegiances with foreign lands. Run up to Syria, hey, can you help us team up against so-and-so or Egypt? Help us fight them. But God has forbidden them to make alliances for protection with foreign powers. He wants to be the one who protects them from all foreign powers. He wants to be the one who also then protects them from the even more evil and vile powers that come in the spiritual realm. He wants to protect them from the devil. He wants to protect them from death. And they're not having any of it. When God draws away, he can't draw you to him. He lets you stew. And evidently at this time, God's people really needed some time in the stew pot because they were tough, unpalatable to God. He couldn't stand the taste. He couldn't stand the stench of what was coming from his people. And he had to turn his back on them, ignore them, spit them out. And trouble will come. Both Israel and Judah will face ongoing problems because they won't listen to their God. Now, it doesn't mean that every day, all day, everything was wrong. No, they had plenty of good times. They had plenty of things that went well for them. But there wasn't any ongoing complete blessing because they were trying to make it on their own. And just as they finally couldn't make it on their own, just as Israel was completely dismantled and Judah was carried off then later on into captivity and allowed back only 70 years later, a fragment of the power and prestige that they'd had before, so also... If God draws away from us, we will be in trouble. But when God blesses us, we will be blessed beyond imagination. When God draws back, we can cope with this life, at least for a time. But we can't cope with what we really need, which is finding our place and purpose in this life. And knowing that this life is not all there is. That this life is not one that's decided finally by how good we are, by how powerful or ruthless we are, by how much we give away or how much we've taken. Finally, our lives are defined by whether or not we believe in the God who created us. God calls you, in the same way he calls them, to really return to him. To take those words to heart that tell you you're a sinner and realize exactly what your sins are, but also even more so to take to heart those beautiful words of forgiveness and promise. When God takes you apart, when God gives you a whipping, when God lets bad things happen to you, it's only for your blessing and your benefit. It's only if you reject him and stay away from him that ultimately it becomes judgment. And you're the one who calls it on yourself. 
God doesn't want to level judgment against you. God doesn't want to drive you away and say, be gone now or forever. God wants you near to him, under his protection, under the shadows of his wings, however you want to look at it, in whatever part of the scripture. That beautiful, loving relationship that he desires is the one that he wants, not just for Israel, not just for Judah, but for you and me. For the Jews and the Gentiles alike, as Paul starts explaining here in Romans. He wants us to receive the mercy that he has for us in Jesus Christ and then to demonstrate that we have received it, acknowledged it, believed it by being merciful, being kind and loving to others, not judging others on the externals, but rather taking them at face value. Something that Jesus' audience in the gospel today was having trouble doing. Because God loves the tax collectors. God loves all of the sinners, and God comes to them that they would not persist in their sin, but celebrate its removal. Jesus doesn't go to Matthew's house and hang with him and those alleged low lives who Matthew knew and hung around with, but Jesus comes there to build a bridge between God and them. Jesus comes there to show that God is merciful, loving and caring, even for those who are on the edges or completely outside of society. God is there for those who the rest of the world points their fingers at and says, boy, I'm glad I'm not like they are. God is there for everyone. But he displays his love, his care, and his concern for those who know that they need it. Jesus talks about being the physician who comes to tend the sick. And what Hosea is telling us is that we're all sick. We need the doctoring that only comes from Jesus. The complete restoration of ourselves. The removal of the unclean heart and its replacement with a right spirit and a clean heart. God desires repentance and love for others before he'll start acknowledging that we have something to offer. When we do realize that we're sinners who are forgiven by grace, then we can offer him things that are pleasing in his sight, whether it's something in the collection plate at church or whether it's acts of kindness and mercy through the rest of the days that we have. You don't want God to step back so you don't think that he's judging you because ultimately there is a judgment. You don't want him to pull back and say, have it your way because your way is finally one of death and decay. God wants you to say, okay, you're in charge. I'm sorry, please forgive me. And then get on with living the life that he's given you to live. You want God near and close. And even when he sounds a little bit judgy in your ears, even when you realize that those Ten Commandments and God's regulations and rules about our behavior with one another and our faith toward him, are absolute and ironclad. When we fall short, God has already fulfilled everything. And when we know we've fallen short, when we know we can't give God what he wants and still keep coming to him asking for things in Christ, because we are forgiven, God is overjoyed to give. So don't wait for God to say, well, have it your way, but rather say, please, Lord. Well, Jesus said it well. Thy will be done. Do it your way. Make me who I'm supposed to be and cause me to think and act the way I'm supposed to think and act. Give me a love like you love and give me people in my life to display it. Be close. Because then I can do the things you want me to do rather than the things that I want to do to my own detriment. And finally, God, make it where I want to do the things that you want me to do. He loves answering prayers like that. He loves coming closer and blessing you and keeping you. Just as it hurts a parent to discipline a child, so God is not happy with having to discipline you. He'd rather hug the stuffings out of you. He'd rather cuddle you close. He'd rather keep you nearby night and day. In repentance, grant him that opportunity to show you just how much he loves you and receive the boundless blessings that come from faith in Jesus. In the name of our Savior, amen. <laughs> the peace that surpasses understanding keep you in Christ Jesus. Amen.